webinar. Thanks so much. for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started today um, to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, but we're very excited for, uh, for the webinar today. We're going to walk you through a new piece of research that we have coming out from the U.S. Financial Diaries project, as well as talk about um, just the very exciting topic of informal finance. Uh, what the realities and implications are, and what financial services providers can learn from um, the speakers that we have on this morning. CFSI is a national nonprofit. We are leaders in financial health, um, and we work with financial services providers across the spectrum to really help uh, folks make high quality products that serve the needs of consumers. Um, with us this morning, we've got two phenomenal speakers. The first is Rachel Schneider, the Senior Vice President of Insights and Analytics here at CFSI, and she's going to be talking about um, new research that's come out from the U.S. Financial Diaries Project. And then second, we have Roberto Bargali from the uh, CEO of Yato Social Funding Circles, and he'll tell you more about the work that he, he does um, and the customers that he works with. So we are going to turn it over to Rachel Schneider to talk more about the recent research um, and what she has found over the past few years in working with many, many Americans across the country um, around the topic of informal finance. Rachel, take it away. Rachel? Yeah. I think you're there. Sorry. So sorry oh. we had you on mute. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered why I was talking, and yet, um, thanks. That's great. So I'm really glad to be here, and thank you all for joining us. Um, uh, can you move to the next slide? It doesn't look like I necessarily have the ability to do so. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. So as Elizabeth said, I'm going to be talking mostly from the U.S. Financial Diaries research that we've been doing. And this is a, um, if you could switch to the next slide, it looks like I can't, so I'm just going to rely on you, Catherine. Um, so the U.S. Financial Diaries is a research project that um, enables to work with about 230 households, so 520 adults in all, and we collected 12 months worth of data with these households where we asked them everything we could about their money, basically. What they were spending, what they were earning, how they were spending it, why they were choosing the financial products that they chose. And the way this worked was that 12 full-time field researchers went out and talked with people on a regular basis in four different research sites across the U.S. And in addition, uh, because we had a long-term relationship with these households, we've been able to go back and ask follow-up questions, make sure we understand the data, and really to go back and ask why. Why are you doing what you're doing? And that's been an extraordinary element of this project. It really distinguishes it from traditional quantitative surveys that give you a snapshot but don't necessarily enable you to delve deeper into the rationale behind decisions that people are taking. Um, if you scroll to the next slide, um, we are really lucky to be joined in this partnership um, with NYU. Um, Jonathan Mordock had done very similar research internationally, and the research we're doing here builds off of that directly and is supported by the, um, the Ford Foundation and the City Foundation, as well as the Omidyar Network. So before I dive into more of what we've heard from others, let's hear from you all on the phone. So we have a poll. How many of you have either borrowed or loaned money to a friend or family member? And you can just so click you on your screen. Two options online. You can click yes or no if you have either personally borrowed or loaned money to loaned money to a friend or family member. We'll give people probably another 10 to 15 seconds to answer, and then we'll we'll see the results. Great, and let's show the results. 
Yes, 82% of you. So that's consistent with what I might have expected and with what we've seen um, in the diaries group. Um, and, and that's a big piece of why we wanted to look at informal finance. It's common. Um, this is not an off the side of our desk activity. Most of us are engaged in financial relationship with friends, family, colleagues in some way. If you scroll to the next slide, you'll see the second reason why we um, think it's important to look at informal finance is that it's not a substitute for formal. So often we think about it as, well, why are people not using banks? Everybody should use banks for everything, right? And um, in fact, people cobble together a variety of services to make their financial lives work. And what you see is that informal finance is a complement, not a substitute for existing um, other uses of other financial products. So among those who we saw saving using savings groups, which I'll talk a bit about um, shortly, or using uh, money guards, 90% of them do have bank accounts in which they could keep this cash. Of the people who borrowed from friends and family or lent to family, uh, of those who borrowed from friends and family, 55% of them also have credit cards. So this is behavior that existing banked clients are participating in. It's an add-on. Let's move to the next slide. You'll see the third reason why we think it's important to look at this, which is that these are the tools people design on their own. And so, you know, I always talk to people about, um, I ask what information helps you design and deliver financial products. And people, of course, use surveys and they use focus groups. And the challenge we all know about is that in a focus group or a survey, you're testing what people think about a concept that you've already designed. And when you look at what people are actually doing, it enables you to go significantly further than that and start from scratch with the problem they're trying to solve and the solutions they're coming up with to solve them. So now I'll talk a little bit about borrowing and lending behavior in particular. So um, wh what I most want to point out in this chart is this second column here. The loans from, friendly and fam from friends and family is the second most common form of credit that we saw among the U.S. Financial Diaries households. It far surpasses the use of payday loans, pawn loans, and auto title, which are topics we tend to spend more time as an industry thinking about. And, and we should think about those products, certainly. Um, but, this, but borrowing and lending from friends and family is, in fact, far more common. Another important thing to note on the next slide is that people are often on both sides of this relationship. So, Within this population, we worked with 41%. So roughly 40% were borrowing. Roughly 40% were lending. 22% were doing both. I think, to me, this emphasizes the idea that it isn't, it isn't a lack of financial capacity that is making people borrow from their friends and family necessarily. Right? It's not, oh, I'm at the edge of my rope, and so I'm going to borrow from my brother. It's that I'm in an ongoing lending and borrowing relationship with the same people or with others in my community. On the next slide, we're showing um, some information about the size of the loans. Now, it, I didn't point this out at the beginning, but it's important to note, looking at this slide, that the people in the U.S. Financial Diaries sample um, are middle and lower income, so about a third below poverty, uh, roughly a third around poverty, and then a third coming into the middle class. And so the loan sizes are all um, relatively small. You might see higher loan sizes among a higher wealth population. Um, and I think what you see is that there's, to me this corresponds with what the biggest gap in the marketplace is, that it's very hard to go and find a $100 loan or a $200 loan. And also people want to spend less time getting those loans. So the, the process of getting a formal loan for $500 has got to be pretty easy before it compares well to going and borrowing money from your brother. On the next slide, we're looking, um, I want to tell just a quick story about the Leones, which is one of the households in the, in the diaries um, group. And so Andrea and Manuel are a married couple. They are recently married, though, and so they haven't fully merged their finances. 
So what we know about their finances is that Andrea has a very consistent income. She's this big, fat, red bar. And for the most part, she receives a regular paycheck. Um, Manuel, however, works for a house cleaning company. So his income by nature has more volatility in it because it depends how much work the company has. And that creates uncertainty in their finances and some amount of spikes, spikes and dips. But from Andrea's perspective, who is the primary manager of the household's finances, it adds, there's an additional complexity, which is that he keeps some of his money to himself for his own expenses and contributes other of his money to, them, to the joint household. And they're, they're really newlyweds and haven't fully talked about how much money he should give on a regular basis. And Andrea's mostly okay with that. Like it gives her some uncertainty, but the flip side is that she has full control over the part of the money that she earns. Right? So it's, it's, it's mixed. Right? Um, the two of them have one child together and then two children from Andrea's previous marriage who live with them. So they receive child support, and that's been fairly consistent. Um, but they're in a transitional phase financially. And as you'll see, they, like many families, receive a significant tax, uh, re um, tax refund in April, and, that, and that's the big purple spike in the middle. So, um, sorry, uh, let's go back to Andrea and, and Manuel. So th they borrowed um, from Andrea's father, and what they did was essentially Andrea is a very savvy user of credit cards, and she act was actively managing her credit card burden, and she had a 0% offer that was going to expire, and she didn't want to start paying interest. So she borrowed money from her father in order to bridge until we sh when she got her tax return and could pay him, him back. She used to have really bad credit because when she got divorced, um, she took on, she had essentially a lot of debt out of that relationship, and she's actively trying to repair her credit, which is part of why she's so focused on her credit cards. And so she's taken out credit cards and religiously repaid them. And she recently applied for a car loan, and through that process got a chance to understand what her credit score is today. And her credit is now quite solid. So she thinks she could have borrowed money from either a different credit card or from a bank when she borrowed money from her father. She didn't go to him because she thought that was her only choice. But she knew it was a three-month loan, and she felt confident about what her source of repayment was going to be. And so she felt this was just the easiest, cleanest option. Uh, so if we move to the next slide, um, We'll talk about some of the advantages of informal credit. Really, it comes down to three things, the convenience, the cost, and the flexibility of repayment. So over half of the people who borrowed uh, report back to us that it's a flexible relationship. And they, un they know that they have to repay it, and there's an expectation of repayment, truly a loan, but they know they'll have flexibility. In only 30% of the cases did people describe having a certain repayment date. And even on the next slide, you'll see that among the, those who describe having a clear understanding about the loan having a certain repayment date, they know that they'll have flexibility if, for some reason, it doesn't work out. And only 17% are reporting that there is absolutely no flexibility here. I, I want to point out that when I've talked about this with lenders, sometimes they say, well, I could never replicate that. Right? There's a worry that if you ex express flexibility to your borrowers, that you'll therefore diminish the likelihood of repayment. But I think it's possible it's the opposite, that, people, that some qualified borrowers are shying away from formal credit because they are concerned there's no flexibility, when in reality, Many consumers know if you, if you call and ask for forbearance, often you can get it. Um, but, but lenders are shy of, of publicizing that fact. Um, but recently I have seen one major credit card company advertising this is one of the benefits of their loan and it'll be of their credit card product. And it'll be interesting to see what their results are. A, a major disadvantage on the next, if you turn to the next slide of informal credit is that it 
it's challenging for the interpersonal dynamics, right? So this quote from one of the participants was evocative for me. It says, I was given no choice. He offered to help out. There's no interest. But even though you get the leeway and they understand your situation, I know I owe him. He knows I owe him. The bank doesn't know when you take a vacation or go out of town, but he does know. And you hear this sort of statement um, repeated regularly. The interconnection of your finances with others in your life is, is both a pro and a con. I suspect this resonates with the 80% of those of us on the call who said we've borrowed um, or lent money to family or friends. Another real advantage, disadvantage of informal credit is that it works well now in the present. Um, you can meet your financial need, but it doesn't build a path towards better products. It doesn't get reported to the credit bureaus. It doesn't increase your credit history. And it's potentially a real strain on the community. It means that any given community is um, lending and borrowing amongst themselves. And for a lower income or a middle income community, that means they're not spreading out their risk across a broader population, which can be a real challenge. So now I'm going to shift gears and talk a bit about savings, but I'm not going to say a lot because I know Roberto is going to focus here, and I think what he has to say is just fascinating, and I want to get to that piece of our, our content as quickly as possible. But I'll lay a little bit of groundwork and point out that savings group behavior, which is sometimes described as lending circle behavior, um, is one of the most exciting things that you see in informal finance. And essentially, the way that savings or lendings groups work is that a group of coworkers or family members or friends um, essentially work together. And sometimes groups are 10 or 15 or 20 people. And the way it works is that each individual pays into a shared pot on a weekly basis. And everybody who's part of the group has, takes turns getting the full amount. So if 10 people are each in a group together and they're um, each contributing $100 over the course of 10 weeks, then every week somebody gets to go home with $1,000. If you're at the beginning of the cycle, this is really borrowing. If you're at the end of the cycle, this is really saving. Either way, it's an extraordinary way to gather chunks of money, usable chunks of money. On the next slide, um, we're showing where we saw this behavior. This is mostly an immigrant activity in at least our study. I saw a national survey recently that suggested about 6% of Americans are participating in this kind of activity. Um, it's really common all over the world and is something that you see immigrant communities bringing to the US with great success. It's probably existed since the beginning of time. Um, on the next slide, um, are pointing out a little bit about why this works, right? So the social connection that people have with each other is a very powerful motivation. I asked one participant in a savings group what would happen if she stopped contributing. She looked at me like I was nuts. Like I had two heads. And somebody else I asked the same question to said, well, it's sacred. It's just not an option to not contribute. And so it prioritizes this savings over other financial obligations that might get in the way, which is connected to something I was saying about debt, because when you have a savings obligation like this and somebody comes and asks you to lend them money, a viable excuse is, I can't. I've got to give it to my savings group. right? And, and that's very powerful for people. On that next slide, um, you'll see a little bit this chart shows um, the blue lines are total income. The red is deposits as a percentage of income. So for one household in particular, it's showing um, the incredible discipline that this behavior is creating because she's saving such a huge percentage of her income here. On the next slide, um, here's a bit more about uh, Melinda Perez who we describe a bit in the research um, piece that we've just put out. She participates in a savings group where she gives $200 increments. So some of the variation you're seeing in this chart is just the difference between months that have four weeks and months that have five weeks. In a few cases, you'll see in September, for example, or April, she is giving less than her full $800 commitment. And in those cases, her sister lends her the money to give to the savings group. 
and then they settle up when she um, receives her chunk of money at the end. And then we'll move to the next slide. So again here, there's some pros and cons, right? The, the limitation here is that um, the flip side of the, you know, the weakness of the corresponding strength I described and how disciplined people become about the savings, the flip side is that they become really disciplined. And sometimes perhaps there's a mismatch between their need for cash flow and their commitment to save. And that can be challenging for people. And as with informal lending, there's a lack of connection point then into the, into the formal system. So this might work today, but again, it doesn't build your credit history. If you're at the beginning of a lending circle cycle and you're essentially borrowing this money and then repaying it, you get no credit for that in your credit history. So in the long term, there's a real advantage to finding connection points between the formal and informal finances that we see. Um, so with that, I'm happy to turn it over to Roberto, who's, I think, really on um, track, like thinking about what the connections are here between informal and formal. Um, and it's really exciting work. And in the meantime, you're seeing here some fantastic information, insights about how to get more on the diaries. You can sign up for our research alerts. You can join us on December 3rd for a live stream on the Hidden Financial Lives of Working Americans will not simply be a repeat of this content. It will be some other um, research that we've done coming out of the same study. And I really encourage you to follow us. We're going to keep having more information to share. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, as a part of the follow-up to this webinar, we will be going ahead and emailing you uh, participants this link. Um, and we really do encourage folks to sign up for the research alerts and join us December 3rd for another event where we talk more in depth about the research presented today. Um, and with that, we'll transition to our next speaker. Um, Roberto Bargali is the CEO of Yato Social Funding Circle. She's going to talk a lot more in depth about the, um, uh, especially the saving circles that Rachel mentioned briefly. Um, at any point, if participants have questions that you'd like to ask of the speakers, go ahead and indicate those through, to us through the chat box. Um, on your menu pan panel for GoToWebinar. We will be doing a bit of Q&A after Roberto speaks. Um, so thanks so much, and go ahead, Roberto. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we're going to speak a little bit about uh, JATOS and what we call the banking on each other, or the P2P lending evolution. So the next slide, please. Okay, the problem is that uh, these are old statistics, but more than one in four, in four U.S. households are either unbanked or they are completely underbanked. And more than six, 63 million adults use payday loans or pawn shops, or, and more than 30 million adults use them once a month. So basically, uh, uh, unbanked and underbanked population is increasing a lot over time, and these are statistics for 2011, and it's getting worse. But basically, the population and unbanked it's increasing, and also the underbanked as well. And 62 million are considered are <coughs> considered credit leapers, and 180 million have access to subprime credit rates. So, and, and the worst part of this is that more than 37 million have no access to credit at, at all. So on the next slide, uh, the solution here is what we call uh, banking on each other, or are the ROSCAS. And basically the ROSCAS are rotating the savings and credit associations. And basically are the savings groups that Rachel speak a little bit about and are very popular in Latin America, China, India, and Africa as well. And they are based basically on, on factors such as honor, trust, and affinity. And participants have normally one degree of separation. And because it's a, it's a matter of honor and trust, we have almost near zero default rates. And all the collections always relies on peer pressure are on, on your social graph. So basically, the Rosca features are peer-to-peer -peer lending, and and but between friends. So 
there, there are an alternative way to use P2P lending w within the closed circle. And the ROSCAS replaced completely the social function that the banking industry has lost. So on the next slide, uh, basically what we what we Jatos do. Basically, Jatos is an electronic platform that allows the creation of different types of ROSCAS on the internet. So basically, we manage all the collections, the escrow, and payouts of the funds in a secure and transparent environment. So basically, uh, we integrate uh, the, the platform with your Facebook account. So we allow that even the participants that are uh, in, 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 in other countries or in other places can participate with you. And basically, Yatos uh, use, use all the social factors that make the ROSCAS work and create them online. So basically, how it works, you create a Yato, you invite your friends and family using your Facebook social graph. Then you decide uh, uh, which position you want to take on, on the on the yatos. Do you want to be the first person to receive the, the the whole fund, or you want to use it as a savings mechanism? So you choose the last positions. Then you can develop a, a reputation, and then you can participate in larger yatos as well. So on the next slide, basically. Uh, Uh, let's talk a about a little bit about APRs, no? And basically, uh, Jatos has the lowest APR, and that's only because we are charging uh, all the uh, the uh, 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 less than six percent of the of, of a platform fee, and all the and um, but we manage all the collections and these burdens completely electronically. So compared to a pawn shop or payday loans, basically the APR is it's almost 10 to 0. No? And there's an estimate that more than 5 billion ROSCAS are running every month uh, worldwide. It, that includes uh, offline uh, ROSCAS as well, of course, and also uh, part of the JATOS that, uh, and, uh, and these e-money pool mechanisms as well. So basically ROSCAS are much more efficient than pawn shops or payday loans. On the next slide, uh, sorry about that. We have three different types of, of, of ROSCAS on, on the JATOS platform. Basically, we have the Tanda. That's the, that's the name of the uh, of the money pool. They, and basically, it's a group of five to ten friends committed to each other to build a collective fund by making regular monthly contributions of a certain amount of money. Then uh, at, this, uh, at each month, all the parti uh, one participant receives the money, and this cycle repeats until all the participants of the group receive the same amount of money. We call this a tanda. Also, we have uh, another ROSCA that is called a loan with, between friends. And basically, uh, on this ROSCA, you specify the amount of money that you need. Then you ask your friends to lend you some of this money, and then you pay back during the following five to ten months without paying interest to your friends. And then we have a new model that we are testing it right now that I'm going to speak a little bit how it works. But basically it's what we call a Jato bid. And basically it's a, it's it's like a panda, but basically it, 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 the group of friends are committed to make a recurring contribution the, to the to the to the group. And then uh, all your friends receive the money contributed. But in this case, if you need the money first, then you place a bid for the money. And the best thing is that the the amount of the bid that 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 this person uh, put uh, are that this bid is is basically distributed among the friends who have not received their money. So it's more than savings because you receive an extra cash and on the on the next slide I'm going to show you how how it really works. So, so basically how, how does a Jato bid work? Then for example, do you need money? How much money do you need? And how much money are you willing to save every month, two weeks, a week, a quarter? So basically, for example, if you need four hundred, then you could save one hundred uh, each month. But uh, on, on this case, the next slide, please. 
uh, every friend will contribute the same amount that you define during the, the a period of time. Then, example, you gather a, another four friends, so every friend will contribute one hundred dollars monthly. So you have a pot of four hundred. Then, uh, if you who wants to who wants to get the money now? So you want to get all the money collected, you place a bid for it. So the friend with the higher bid will get all the money. So, for example, in month number one, we have five friends, and everybody make the contribution of 100. But in this case, Clark put a bid of of, of this amount of money. Bruce put uh, 19 dollars. Pierre put a bid of 20. Because he put the higher bid, he will receive the, the what was collected minus the twenty dollars for the bid. He he's going to receive three hundred and eighty US, and the rest of the twenty dollars are distributed to the other friends. So and this happens all the cycles on the next month. The next the Peter he already received the money. So he he only puts the contribution. He he's not allowed to bid anymore. But in this case, uh, uh, Logan put a 15, uh, 15 US bid. So basically, uh, what is collected is 400 plus the bid earnings of the of the past of the previous month minus what he bid. He's going to receive 390. So this it repeats every cycle on month three. In this case. Clark make the higher speed, and he received uh, the 400 collected plus the earnings of previous bids minus what he bid on this time, and he received 400 exactly. On the on the month four, on the month number four, uh, the the money goes in this case to Diana, and 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 we meet. Uh, here's the map: 400 plus 15 previous bids. Minus what he, what she did this time, he received four hundred and five dollars. And on the last month, uh, the last person of this circle was Bruce, and basically he, he there are not uh, bids anymore, so he received four hundred collected plus twenty five dollars of previous bids, so he receives a total of four hundred and twenty five uh, dollars. So this is, uh, the, I think, this is a very uh, a practic a practical mechanism. So it's more if you really, really uh, need the money, you put a bid, and if you want the money more for savings, so you you always bid very, very low, and you're going to earn a little bit more. So th we're testing this this mechanism right now, and this is uh, some demographics that we have right now on the platform who are using us. And basically, uh, we uh, the, the platform is running right now in two countries, the United States and in Mexico. And and as uh, Rachel told us, this is more like a cultural thing, an immigrant thing. And I think uh, Mexico really, really knows uh, the money pools, the tandas. So basically, uh, we have more uh, more people using the platform from Mexico right now. On the gender, uh, we have that male 56% and female 44%. And basically, on, on the age, this is how it compares how the age that we have on the platform. And basically, uh, we have uh, the older people, surprisingly here, 40 to 50 years, are the ones that they are used to this kind of mechanisms because uh, Tandas and Money Pools and Roscas are very very it's a very very old and traditional concept and they are very very familiar so it's not it's not surprised that a teenager for example that he really really doesn't know how a savings group or a rosca works no? and basically uh, Yatos right now by the numbers since we launched the, the platform last last year we have uh, we have seen these numbers. We have seven seven hundred eighty three yatos, and five hundred twenty three are tandas. Uh, Two hundred and forty three are uh, loans with your friends. And right now we are testing the the, the bidding uh, yatos. Uh, where, and we only have these numbers right now. 
but so far so good. I think this is these numbers are going to increase uh, in in the very near future, and and basically for what they are using us and basically it's for business. Uh, they want to fund a, a startup or grow a business or they want to buy a inventory or want to buy a new equipment or so, and the other. Uh, and the other large percentage is for debts. So they, they want to pay late bills or pay credit cards because credit cards have a very high interest. So they want to to put more money on the credit cards so they can reduce the interest, or they want to pay loans to somebody else or to or to or to banks. So basically, that these are the statistics that we have right now on the platform, and some other. A percentage share for education, uh, paying tuitions or traveling or buy something, and and basically that, that's it. That's what that's what we are doing uh, right now with the platform online, and, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Roberto. There was a quick question about the bids. Is there a time limit on the bids? Yeah, basically, uh, you have like uh, like like two days for 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 the bid. So basically, you receive an alert or an email or an SMS that that you need to bid. And if you don't bid, we put the lowest bid that it's that that it's possible in the system. So basically, uh, you have like 48 hours to to complete your personal bid. Thank you. And how do people receive the funds? Do they need a bank account, or is there another mechanism to get people the money? Uh, that's a very good question. And basically, it depends on the country. Uh, in in United States, definitely you need a, a bank account because we are doing everything with ACH in the United States. But in Mexico, the basically you can put the money. In, also, use convenience stores like 7-Eleven. And then you can put the money in a in the convenience stores to pay your jato, and also to receive the money you can use a convenience store. Uh, Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we're going to open it up to questions. If participants on the webinar have questions for either Rachel or Roberto, please do type those into the questions box, um, and we'll start reading them as many as we can get through to the participants today. Um, I think that there is a, a, a question if we take a step back on, on both of the work that you both have been doing around behaviors of saving. Um, and I'd really like to hear from Rachel and your work with U.S. Financial Diaries and you know, elsewhere in doing uh, work with CFSI. What has surprised you that you've learned about why people do or don't save? What have you found that's interesting? Well, I think um, one thing it's worth pointing out about savings behavior is that some of our construct about it is is too rigid. So a lot we we tend to think people aren't saving if they haven't amassed a significant amount of capital for long-term usage, right? And the reality is that people are saving for intra-year expenses all the time. They're thinking in advance about the fact that they have property tax payments due six months from now or nine months from now, and putting money aside or they're thinking about um, their tax refund really as a savings vehicle where they know they'll be able to pay down debt when they get that. So we see a lot of savings behavior. It's just that it, it accumulates and then gets spent out in the course of 6, 9, 12, 18 months versus the 30-year cycle where you think about when you think about retirement savings or 10 years to accumulate you know, enough money to go to college or have a down payment. Thanks. And Roberta, what, um, what would you say that surprised you? Um, one of the things that actually surprised me from your presentation was the amount of funds that are used towards for business expenses. Can you say something about that and anything else that you found interesting in the work you've done around uh, habits of, of saving? Yeah, basically people, uh, they are very, uh, well, people, I don't know, but what we have uh, see is that they are very bad to, to, to savings. They don't have the habit. And basically the money that, uh, at least here in Mexico, what we have studied is that they have the money and then they try to spend all the money without a discipline to make savings. And I think that the JATOS, it, it's a platform that, they, uh, that once they are in, then they have the commitment 
to make the savings and make it, and making the payments. It's not until they have the the, the obligation that or or that this uh, that they start making the savings. Great, thanks so much. There are quite a few questions coming in, and I'd love to hear both of you talk a little bit more about. Um, how you think banks and credit unions can learn from the work that um, the, the work that both of you have been doing. Um, Rachel, why don't we start with you because I know you've given a lot of thought to how this would apply to innovation areas for, um, for banks and credit unions. Sure, I'm happy to get started. I mean, I think, um, you know, a huge um, way to think about this is that there are some things you can do to just directly build from what we've described. And I think um, Yato's is a terrific example, right? Formalizing an existing behavior, turning it into a business activity um, is valuable and holds promise in a variety of ways. You think about peer-to-peer -peer lending writ large, it's really just a way of formalizing the informal borrowing and lending that we're describing. You up, describing. So that's one thing to think about. Um, the other, the second thing to think about is, um, Leveraging the more abstract descriptions of what we're describing for product development. So, for example, why does the savings group work? It works because it's a public commitment with social norming attached to it. So, what other innovations could we think of that would be public commitments with social norming attached to it? This isn't the only one, and there's something about that idea that um, enables people to, to make different decisions. So, I think about um, the work. You know, some people have tried to use social media to social norm around spending. And I think there's promise there. It makes sense to start thinking about how does my budget compare to other people in my age or income bracket? How does my retirement savings compare to other people in my age and income bracket? Those, um, there's a danger there that the social norming could set expectations that are too low, but it's also possible they could set, um, encourage people to be more inspirational. and try harder to achieve their financial objectives. So I think there's a lot here on that. If you think about it in that way, so social norming has power. The fact that people have limited attention to give to a variety of financial decisions is also really important to think about. I don't believe that people can save for all of the things they need to save for at once effectively and manage their, their spending all of the time. It's a little bit like dieting. We all need splurges. We only have so much attention to give to eating healthily. Um, you're you're going to decide to have cake at a party, right? And I think that um, part of what we see in some of the savings groups is that what it's doing is focusing attention on a specific savings goal with regularity and consistency and reminder, and that's a, particularly useful. So you can imagine other products that that build on that idea. Um, and then, then I think the third thing I'd argue, argue is that linkages between this informal activity and formal are incredibly powerful. So anything we can do to make this informal behavior become part of our credit scoring, credit history, um, assessments of credit worthiness in general process, I think is particularly useful. I think that's a really interesting uh, point uh, and one that is brought up, um, you know, sometimes when talking about uh, different types of um, uh, saving or financing is that it doesn't always get, especially in the United States, reported to the credit scoring agencies. Roberto, can you speak a little bit about um, either work that you're doing or other models that you've seen that have been trying to build linkages to either building credit scores um, or, or getting people a little bit more traction on their credit history? Yeah, thank you. Uh, basically, uh, as Jatos is a platform and is not uh, a financial institution, uh, we have some limitations that to report the activity to the credit bureaus. Uh, that basically, there is something that we are working on because uh, we have seen some studies. Also, there is a, a, an organization in San Francisco that is called Mission Asset Fund that they are doing exactly the same thing as JATOS, but completely offline. And they are reporting that activity to the credit bureaus. And basically, if you report like four consecutive uh, good payments to the credit bureau, it, it can increase your 
FICO score in 52 points. So I think it's it's a good thing to do, and I think uh, uh, these funding circles are a very good mechanism in order to increase your your scoring. But basically, but right now we are not doing it, but we want to do it in a very near future. Thanks, Roberto. And I wanted to circle back to the earlier question I asked about linkages with banks or credit unions. Can you say anything about the work that you're doing um, or thinking about partnerships with, with other types of financial institutions? Yeah, yeah, definitely. There, there's a big bank here and also in Mexico and in Latin America that uh, they want to embrace this model completely. So we are uh, probably in the in the next year we are going to make a big alliance, uh, so they can uh, they can expand uh, uh, this model onto the to the online ecosystem as Yatos, but with the partnership of this bank. Great, thanks. I think that's a, I think there's a lot of opportunity there for. Um, um, banks and credit unions to think about what the applications of these approaches could be, um, which is really great. Thank you. There are quite a few questions coming in from online around the, um, the population, the millennial population or the younger population. Um, and I'm just wondering, maybe Roberta, we'll start with you on this one. Um, are you seeing different or unique behaviors in the younger group? Um, as, a, as opposed to the older generations, and, and how are you working with that target audience in particular um, to help make use of, you know, the channels and the habits that they have? Well, the millennials, as, uh, as, I, as I put it in my demographics, they are right now, in the, at least on the online platform that we have right now, they are uh, a segment that they are, they are not so used to this kind of mechanisms or social circles or social common circles. And they are not so aware of what really you can do with, with a social funding circle. So once you explain them and you say, hey, look, if you make a circles with your friends, you can probably save and for, for the next uh, uh, iPhone, for example, or for your next uh, computer or for whatever you need. For, but uh, at the beginning, uh, it, it's 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 a, it's a concept that it's very catchy. So once once they get it, uh, they 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 say, oh, this is cool. But I think it's it's more uh, it's more a, a problem of of educating them. So I think that we are working on that. We are making some webinars, and also we are making some uh, videos uh, completely available on our website. So to explain them in a very fun way, how, how does a, a, a social funding circle works? That's what we are doing yeah. right now. That's great, thank you. And Rachel, was there anything interesting that you found from your research on um, this younger population, folks in their 20s and early 30s? Not specifically from the diaries population, but I do think even the way we're talking about it on this call, like I'm as guilty of this as anyone. Um, isn't necessarily going to resonate with millennials. We're talking about how can banks and credit unions use these learnings. They're not going to think about it that way. They're going to think about it as what service provider is best for me. Um, and they aren't necessarily going to limit themselves to banks and credit unions. They're going to think about online options and they're going to think about um, technology providers and really anyone who you know, seems like they're going to offer a good service. Thank you. Rachel, I wanted to um, get back to the U.S. Financial Diaries. It's, it's collected an immense amount of data and information um, across the country, you know, very intensively, as you mentioned, um, over 200 households. Um, there's a lot of research there, and I know um, that project is looking at a lot more topics than, um, you know, just borrowing and, and saving and lending. Um, how do you hope that this that this data and research really impacts the financial services industry, and where do you see it going next? It's a big question. So I have at least two things to say. One is, um, but I'll limit myself to that. One is that I do think this study is going to give us a deeper understanding of how people's financial lives work in a broad way. And so 
um, what we're seeing is a level of intra-year volatility that isn't fully baked into any of our expectations about budgeting or um, transaction products or savings. So there's, and it's not fully baked into our expectations around how public policy can be more useful in advancing the financial health of Americans more broadly. So one piece of how I think diaries will be used is just a deeper understanding of what's really happening with Americans in the modern economic era that we're in, which has some very dis distinct features that are different than how our economy worked 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, so that's one piece. I also think that uh, at a more granular level, we're going to see things about how people manage their finances that are directly useful in innovation for innovators, but useful in terms of inspiring innovation, not useful in terms of uh, prescripting the answer. And so I think it'll be a, a lot of learnings like this, like what we're seeing in informal finance, where it's not that you can necessarily go out and now start a company to do exactly what we've described. It's that um, we'll have some insights into behavior and motivations and how people think that is useful in developing a better intuition about what customers really need. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Um, Roberto, there's a few questions um, that have been sent in to us around, um, you know, the size of the savings that uh, Yachos is able to, to help equip people with um, and possibly the limitations in, in getting people only so far with this model. What's your vision for people outside of of Yato's reach, and, and how do you think that your model is able to affect change more broadly for the industry? Well, uh, yeah, basically uh, uh, how Yato's was uh, born is because in, in a very early years I was looking for an alternative uh, vending, and uh, then I realized that, that this uh, circles was a very good uh, but was an additional way to 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 get get a loan. So I, I I invite my friends, but I made all the collections myself. Something that Yatos allows you to do is that all the collections and disbursements are completely automatic. So that's uh, when you uh, organize these circles manually, you have to make the collections. So imagine that you have 10 friends, so you have to go to the houses of your 10 friends and collect the money. So th this is a very time-consuming uh, uh, labor when you're organizing uh, uh, these kind of circles. So our vision was that if we can put these uh, systems completely online and we can connect it with the social graphs, I think it, it could work and it, it will allow you to really, really not to worry about the collections and disbursements and completely uh, make this uh, circle completely online and completely automatically. Uh, so far, the YATOs that we have run, we have almost zero defaults. And basically, uh, uh, right now, at least here in Mexico, you can make uh, the collections using your debit card. Also, you can make you can pay in convenience stores, or you can make a direct deposit in in in, in a bank, and everything is completely linked, and it's completely and all the people on the circles they know when you pay, so basically it's 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 a very transparent platform, and our vision was to create something that uh, that we can use uh, in our current uh, in our with all the millennials that they can use this platform and to put this technology available as the worldwide. So basically, I really want to expand the JATOS not only to Mexico, not only to United States, but we want to expand this to Africa or to China. And that, that's, that, that's the vision, to put this platform as an alternative way to make savings. Well, that's no less than ambitious, but we wouldn't expect anything less from you. Um, Roberta, we've got some next steps for the U.S. Financial Diaries up on the screen. I know uh, that on your website you guys have a blog and some really cool videos in both English and Spanish that have more information. Um, for the folks on the phone who have submitted questions that are a little more technical or, or around your model um, and what you do, are there some online resources that you'd like to point people to to get more information? 
Well, basically, yes, it's the, we have the, our website that it's www.jatos with a double T dot com and basically we have the blog and also we have a, a contact form so they can also submit the, my uh, questions if they have or if they have more technical questions I will be more than happy to answer them to my email. Great. So thank you both so much for taking the time out to share um, some of what you've seen and what you've learned around um, you know, savings groups as well as models of borrowing and lending um, in the work that you do. I think it's been incredibly a valuable, invaluable hour. Um, so we thank you for sharing with us. For the folks who are still on the phone or on the webinar, thank you so much for taking time out of your day um, to listen in. We will go ahead and send out a link to the full video um, and some follow-up items that you can do in an email. Um, for all those of you who registered and for anyone here who wants to share the information with other colleagues who are maybe unable to join today. Um, but thank you everybody for, for participating and um, we look forward to watching the exciting work that you both will be doing over the next few weeks and months. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>